let's play a little game. I'm gonna flip this coin, and if it lands on heads, I win, and if it lands on tails, you lose. Sounds unfair, but that's actually how banks get to invest their money. What's up everybody, I am Jaspreet Singh and welcome to the Minority Mindset. Over the last few decades, the financial services industry grew from a few companies selling loans and insurance to a monster industry that represents a huge portion of our GDP that sells the most confusing financial instruments you can think of. Now, it's not just your basic loans and mortgages, we're talking about investment derivatives, infinite leverage, credit default swaps, and collateralized debt obligations. If you don't know what that means, you're not alone. Very few people do. And by the time you're done watching this video, you're going to understand the financial industry better than most people in the world. That's why in this video, I want to go over how some of these financial instruments really work. So make sure you watch this video until the end because you want to know how these instruments are affecting you and the economy. But before we get into that, hit that thumbs up button below because if you don't, then YouTube doesn't share our video with anybody else. Subscribe to the Minority Mindset YouTube channel. That way you don't miss our new financial education videos every single week. And hit that little notification bell too because if you don't, then YouTube doesn't let you know when our new videos are released. Have you ever heard the saying, banks never fail? It's not because of bailouts. We've had some exceptions like Lehman Brothers, but they were filled with toxic assets. But the reason people say that is because institutional investors like banks have certain powers that you don't. Let me put it this way. Normally when you make an investment, you make money when your investment goes up. But what if you could invest your money into something and if it goes up, you make a lot of money and if it goes down, you still make money. What kind of wizardry are you talking about, Jaspreet? Well, this is how almost every bank makes their investments and I'll show you what I mean. Back before the 2008 crash, banks would lend people money and then they would make something like four, five, six percent interest on every dollar they lent to you. But that mortgage game was boring. I mean, who wants to sit around and wait 30 years for you to pay off your mortgage? That's when the financial services industry got creative. They realized, wait, we can just take this 30 year mortgage we sold you and sell it to another investor that way we get our cash now and then we can lend this money out again and then sell it again and then lend this money out again and sell it again. So then the financial services industry started to grow faster because they were getting craftier and credit was becoming easier to access. Then they realized, wait, we can take your 30 year mortgage and your neighbor's 30 year mortgage and dozens of other 30 year mortgages and chop them all up and sprinkle a little bit of salt on top and then package a bunch of little pieces of mortgages together into something called a collateralized debt obligation or CDO and then we can sell the CDO to other wealthy institutions or banks and make huge profits. This created a huge boom in the financial services industry because now banks weren't just in the business of selling you loans, they were in the business of selling you loans and then converting these loans into something else and selling these other financial instruments and derivatives to other wealthy institutions and banks to make huge profits and they were selling the same loans again and again and again to multiply their profits. Well, when banks started to realize how much money they could make off of a simple 30 year mortgage, they started to get even more crafty and this created a new boom in the financial services industry when three things happened. First, to keep fueling this system, they needed more people to buy loans and so that's when they created ninja loans and they started promoting subprime loans. Ninja stands for no income, no job, no asset loans. So you could walk into a bank with nothing and write down how much money you want, $200,000, and then you could walk out of the bank with $200,000 and a free TV. You say free TV? I'm in. And subprime loans became very popular, which are loans to people with bad credit because banks thought homes can't go down in value. So what's the big deal if we sell a home to somebody who can't afford it because the homes is gonna go up in value. Second came the crafty credit default swap or CDS. See, the insurance companies saw how much money the banks were making through mortgages and they got a little bit jealous. Why can't we get in on the fun too? That's when the financial services industry got together again and got even more crafty. The insurance company said, okay banks, look, 
We all know that real estate cannot come down in value, but how about we get in on the fun as well? How about we create an insurance program for your real estate investments? This way, just in case something happens and your real estate investments go down, then we'll come in and we'll pay you money. This is the famous credit default swap. Now, banks were working hand in hand with the insurance companies because if real estate prices would come down, banks would be okay because they're paying money to the insurance company to ensure their real estate investments from something bad. Now, banks can't lose. It's the perfect plan. If real estate values go up, banks make a lot of money. If real estate values come down, they still make money. Now, the financial services industry was booming and it wasn't about selling loans or insurance anymore. It's about being crafty and making as much money as possible off of each investment out there. To put it in perspective, in the mid 1990s, credit default swaps didn't even exist. And by 2012, the credit default swap industry became a 24 trillion dollar business. That's when phase three happened. Banks went all in. Okay, let's switch the game around now. Heads you win and tails I lose. If this is the game, how much money would you wager? Banks could not believe how perfect their system was working. First, they just made simple loans, and then they turned these simple loans into fancy financial instruments called derivatives, and then they sold these derivatives for huge profits, and then they took out insurance against these derivatives, that way in case something did go wrong, they would still come out a winner. So when banks realized that they couldn't lose, they started leveraging up their investments to the moon because real estate can't go down in value. But what nobody really thought through clearly was what would happen if real estate prices did crash. Fast forward a little bit to 2008 and now real estate prices tanked and this whole house of cards came crumbling down. Banks were over leveraged, overexposed, and now insurance companies like AIG, remember them, had to start paying up. AIG was like the biggest insurance company of the time and they had sold more credit default swaps than anybody else and it was time for them to pay. So real estate prices crashed and these real estate investments went to crap and then banks went over to the insurance company and said, okay, things went bad, now pay up. And then insurance companies didn't have the cash to pay for all this because, well, they ran out of money. See, insurance companies were just like banks. They never thought that real estate would actually come down in value. This created a whole financial meltdown because first the loans failed, and once the loans failed, the loan derivatives failed, and once the loan derivatives failed, this pushed all the insurance derivatives to fail too. And then banks and insurance companies were bailed out thanks to your generous tax dollars because this grew into an industry that was too big to fail. Not a bad system. If you win, you win big. And if you lose, you still win big. Now, in 2020, people are worried about something similar happening, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. But if you are looking for an easy way to stay up to date on what's happening in the finance and business world like this, well, that's why we created the free Minority Mindset Newsletter, where our team first breaks down the top finance and business news, and then we show you how this news affects your wallet. That way you can be smart with your money. We email you this newsletter every morning, Monday through Friday at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can read it in less than five minutes. So if you wanna start getting your financial newsletters, you can do that by clicking the link up here or by clicking the link in the description below. By the way, our financial news emails are different from our financial education emails. After the 2008 crash, banks started to get a whole lot more cautious and the financial services industry started to shrink. I mean, banks started to be a little bit more strict with who they gave loans to. Ninja loans became history. Subprime loans became history. Isn't it funny how it takes like a whole economic collapse for people to start taking their money seriously? But you know what they say, banks will be banks. Uh, no one says that, Just Well, in 2017, you started to see CDOs and CDO derivatives like synthetic CDOs come back to life. Banks probably missed how much money they were making. Now, don't worry. They told us that banks learned a lesson. This is just a way for them to to grow the financial services industry and create more jobs. But there is something that you should know. After the 2008 crash, there were a lot of heavy regulations put on banks when it came to selling mortgages. And so that's when the banks and the financial services industry got crafty again. So they shifted to the commercial real estate industry. By 2011, banks were selling you commercial loans to buy real estate. So if you wanted to buy a shopping plaza or a mall, they would sell you this loan and then they would take these commercial real estate loans, chop them up, put a little bit of salt on it, and put them into an index called the CMBX. 
and then they would take these CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and sell them to other wealthy institutions. We're back, baby! Banks weren't ready to start playing this game with residential real estate loans back in 2011, but they were ready with the commercial real estate loans. Well, when this commercial real estate CDO business started booming, that's when the credit default swap started coming back, this time for the commercial real estate investment derivative. So banks are going out and spending billions of dollars on these commercial real estate CDOs, and then they would protect their investment by going out the very next minute and buying a credit default swap, the insurance against the CDO. Things go up, I win. Things come down, I still win. Oh, and uh, in case you are wondering, you can't buy a credit default swap against your investments. You have to be a big institution. This isn't a problem when times are good because when things are good, people are making money hand over fist. But if things come crashing down, that could be a problem. Actually, this is why Carl Icahn, the billionaire investor, his biggest position right now is shorting the commercial real estate industry. Well, to be a little bit more specific, he's shorting the credit default swaps, the insurance against these loans on shopping malls. Remember the movie The Big Short? Well, this is kind of like The Big Short 2.0. Young people like to shop online, and that's not good news for shopping malls where they need people to go and drive there, park their car, walk inside, and then start shopping. And now, because of this great lockdown, you have dozens of major retailers on the verge of bankruptcy. JC Penney, David's Bridal, Neiman Marcus, GNC. Well, if these stores are not making enough money, then they're not gonna have enough money to pay their rent. And if these stores are not paying their rent, then the shopping mall owner is not gonna have enough money to pay their loan. And now if the shopping mall owner isn't paying their loan, then the banks are gonna have troubles with their commercial real estate loans. And if that happens, this could trigger another commercial this time, real estate crash. If that happens, then banks are gonna turn over to the insurance, the credit default swaps to get their money. That's what Carl Icahn is betting billions of dollars on. And hopefully these institutions learn the lessons, but if banks and the insurance companies that sold these credit default swaps run out of money, then we could be looking at another round of bailouts and a much bigger issue again. Nobody can predict the future. But what we do know is that every crisis comes with opportunity for those people who think different. Plus, you gotta stay up to date on what's happening in the finance and business world. And if you're looking for an easy way to stay up to date, well, we have our free finance and business newsletter and I got the link for it in the description below. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, share it with one friend. That way we can help spread the word. If you do want to learn more about this real estate bubble that might be forming, I already made a video on it and you can watch this video on YouTube by clicking this button right over here. Thank you for watching and as always, keep hustling.